Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. Our today's webinar um, is about the virtualization and next gen virtualization infrastructure and all kinds of cloud nativeness. So, is your next gen virtualization infrastructure actually cloud native? Before we start, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Artem Andreev. I'm a product manager at Mirantis. Um, I'm specifically responsible for the virtualization line of products. That includes uh, the old uh, legacy products like uh, based on OpenStack, as well as the new Bright and Shiny, uh, and this OpenStack on Kiber for Kubernetes. Um, this is something uh, that we will be also discussing in today's webinar. So first of all, we'll discuss uh, the virtualization like as a trend in, on the market. So there is a big concern whether virtualized workloads, virtualization of applications is out of uh, fashion these days where the whole market is moving, what's going on basically. Uh, we will talk about uh, OpenStack as a solution for, as a virtualization platform, also as an alternative for pretty well-known VMware. Uh, we will cover the benefits that the modern approaches to applications actually provide to the uh, cloud platforms themselves. This is a, a tricky one, right? So um, how do we improve uh, virtualization platforms for the practices that we actually use for applications? <laughs> And also, we uh, very quickly will talk through the offerings that Mirantis is providing uh, how Mar uh, to, to our customers, how Mirantis is helping our customers to actually transition from old uh, legacy way of uh, deploying and managing applications to like cloud native environments. So big, big question of today, today's uh, presentation is virtualization still relevant? We all know that the overall industry is moving to containers, moving to serverless, moving to cloud native approaches. It's a big hype, big trend. Well, and nobody's talking about uh, VMs these days, virtual machines these days. Yeah, so probably you, uh, you as people who probably are uh, anyhow involved into like, you know, application delivery uh, and cloud applications, clouds, dealing with clouds, you, you ask yourself questions like, are my, am I doing like the right thing um, when running, still dealing with this, like, you know, uh, the virtual machines? Should I be looking into, you know, updating my applications, re re rewriting them for modern practices, for modern mechanisms? Well, uh, to answer this question, we first need to agree on something like what is virtualization, what is container containerization of applications, what is cloud native, where the whole thing is moving, how these uh, approaches are different, how they relate to each other. And let's take, I, I'm, again, I'm coming from my own personal experience with many of the big enterprise customers, how this story uh, of, of application evolution was uh, did look like. So first, it's a typical to start with like legacy approach. Basically, there are teams who develop their apps that, that mean like internal services or services for public, but all, all of them have something in common. They are very, very heavy to develop and deploy. Why? Because they follow the approach when you for a single service single application run needs a dedicated server sitting somewhere in the data center. The, data, uh, the server needs to be somehow wired, provisioned, configured. And well, basically that means that in order to, you know, uh, deploy an app, uh, publish an app, you would need to go through the overall, this whole process of hardware procurement, configuration, et cetera, et cetera. So it takes really weeks of time of getting like an application to market when you first develop it. I'm not talking about such things as like, you know, uh, testing playgrounds, development playgrounds for, for, for the engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bold, big and heavy 
infrastructure that needs somehow maintained. Okay, how to optimize all this, right? What, what's the obvious step to optimize all that? Use virtual machines, right? So platforms like uh, VMware, vSphere, so we, we just replace bare metal servers with virtual machines. So the time to market significantly re reduces at this point, right? So because you, well, in order to create a machine, well, you, you either do it through yourself or through the UI that the cloud orchestration system provides, or um, you like uh, file a ticket in your IT department and they do it for yourself, all, all the you know creation of the resources, the virtual network connectivity, storage, they do all that, right? Uh, and at some point, well, well it's, it, it's still like, it is, it is a big improvement as compared to like bare metal, really, but still not enough. So it takes kind of days now to get your uh, value to the target audience. And at this point you start thinking, okay, how can I improve this further? And well, obvious uh, answer is okay. Um, your virtualization platform, provides a good API. There are a lot of tools, automation tools that are, can deal with this API. So what you do, you write a lot of scripting, uh, templating, and basically let your application provision itself through these tools, right? Through this um, configuration management, uh, kind of a utilities, right? And, this is actually the point where cloud native nativeness actually starts, right? Because well, having virtual machines just run and stand alone, providing services, it's not really a cloud, right? The cloud starts where the self-service element comes into play. That you don't have to deal with anyone, with any other teams like IT departments, data center management guys. You do things on your own when you need it, how you need it, using the standard tools and the standard APIs. But of, of course, I mean, that's not a comprehensive definition, right? But this is one of the key components, right? Uh, there are a lot of other factors um, to cloud nativeness that actually you can find on the internet uh, by Googling 12 factor applications, right? There is also like questions of how the code, uh, the automation code is stored, how the uh, storage is, provision to how the uh, mm, kind of applications access their data, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot, a lot to that, right? Um, having this tooling, having this um, wrapping around your app allows you actually to uh, use public clouds as well. So and actually simplifies this transition a bit. So that it, it opens up this world of self-service uh, and your application is being hosted not in your data center, but somewhere else, right? Um, what's next, right? Okay, we, we have VMs, we have um, we have orchestration. Cool. How do we improve things even further, right? Containers. Why containers? Well, VM is pretty is a pretty rigid thing, right? So. It has a dedicated slice of resources that you allocate and might not necessarily use completely, right? So it's a good thing, way to uh, fight with fragmentation of resources, but uh, it's not like an ultimate solution to this. So containers are pretty close to being just like normal processes running on the operating system, but well, just a bit better isolation layer in between the host OS and themselves, right? So, and therefore they provide much better flexibility in terms of um, how fast, uh, how they can be deployed, how fast they can be spinned up, how they interact, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, the obvious ne the next step is to containerize pieces of your applications, put them into containers, start using Docker images, for example, to deliver them. Uh, and Often this virtualization and containerization parts approaches, they get mixed. So basically you, say, uh, you take 
VMs, you deploy your and you deploy your containers inside your VMs, right? And there you still kind of get a dedicated slice of resources, but you use this slice more uh, wisely, more efficiently, because you can uh, put your services into a single place, into a single VM, and but have them isolated from each other, right? And the obvious next step is to add orchestration to this um, mix, right? So we have solutions, we have technologies like, for example, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, right? That provide APIs that allow you as an application developer configure certain rules uh, that describe how the application should behave. Uh, for example, rules that uh, would tell your application to spin up more services, API services, uh, in case there is a high, you know, demand, high load on on on, on your particular application at this moment. It's a very simple example, of course. So uh, these orchestration uh, solutions, technologies, they allow to uh, do a lot of things, much more than that. So and really speed up and make uh, the application delivery much faster, right? And again, you can use these technologies both in private cloud on your premise and in the public cloud. So, because the APIs are standard, the tools are pretty much standard. Of course, there are little nuances in the in the way in the way these or that um, specific distribution or technology is implemented. But uh, in the end, this really increases uh, the ability for applications to be ported to another platform without a, like a big investment. Well, uh, the ultimate uh, place where all these kind of uh, Containerized applications are going is pretty much serverless, at least as of the moment, right? Something else might appear on the horizon going further, but right now it's the serverless approach where um, all of your application, you don't have to deal with anything but just the code, right? You don't have to build images, you don't have to spin up VMs, you just have an entry point to which you submit the code of your application. And there it goes. It spins up automatically. It contains all the necessary rules describing this behavior. Voila. Well, of course, in ideal world, <laughs> in reality, it's not that easy, but still a bit easier, uh, a bit easier than containers, and well, significantly easier than dealing with VMs. Good. So at this point, we defined the evolution path. Right. Great. So let's try to see where the market actually is right now. Where, what is the majority doing in terms of virtualization and containerization? That would help, I think, I hope that would help to, uh, you guys position yourself like in the market to see how relevant you are. Um, yes, and surprisingly, well, surprisingly to someone, maybe. Um, well, virtual machines are pretty much being used and are going to be used. That's according to the research. So yes, the containerization part is growing. Um, but virtualization part is basically staying maintaining the same level of usage and is, is, is likely going to maintain that, which is great. Although I would draw your attention to the fact that like bare metal servers, that meaning that it is still a thing, but slowly reducing, right? Slow, very slowly. So that means that the industry is moving, but not that fast as we might think it is. Yeah, I mean, I know there is a lot of, you know, articles all around the place, people doing tech talks, people doing uh, conference presentations around how they manage to use Kubernetes for this and that and serverless for this and that. But as a matter of fact, a lot of people are still doing VMs and even are still doing bare metal servers and even mainframes. Surprise, surprise. Okay, so then Let's talk a bit about the virtualization market. What's going on there? Uh, yeah, so as I said, 
were not going their virtualized applications are not going away. There is a few reasons, good reasons for that. There are still applications that are legacy uh, or that not, not using bare metal anymore, but cannot go further than just VMs because they, they are written this way, right? And rewriting these applications, is it really worth it? Well, you tell me, but in most of the cases, they are not. I mean, they're generating their business, they're generating their value. And really, why not just sustain sustain them as they are and maybe think about something uh, fancy as in the next iteration of like when it's time to rewrite them. There are still workloads that require specific hardware. A typical example, um, for example, there are such thing as natural network function virtualization. When people uh, take network appliances like those provided by Cisco, by Juniper, and they virtualize them. It makes sense, yeah, because uh, again, of the resource granularity um, to make to consume resources, hardware resources more efficiently. But these um, uh, network appliances, they often require specific uh, hardware underneath, uh, CPUs, memory, specific techniques to accelerate data traffic processing. So something that it's not that easy down through containers. But virtualization platforms, modern virtualization platforms are doing a great job at actually um, providing these workloads with access to the underlying hardware whenever it's necessary. Yeah, and um, as I mentioned, it doesn't really make sense financially and economically to invest into conversion of these such workloads into something else into containers, at least as of now you know, on the short term uh, time frame. Therefore, it's likely, for, uh, highly likely that for another five years, we will be and will keep dealing with virtual machines. And therefore, we need tools and software to do this efficiently, right? So what's going on with the virtualization landscape per se? So first of all, the trend that we at Marantis observe pretty much is the shift from fully private or fully public cloud usage to something in between, something mixed. So basically big companies, they prefer not to put all of the eggs into the same basket, right? And try to distribute their applications across private infrastructure and public infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, to basically place them, the apps, wherever uh, it makes the most sense financially, right? And also what we, ob we observe in terms of the um, vendors that are providing solutions for doing that, that like a big event which happened uh, last year is the acquisition, yeah, well, announcement <laughs> of intent to by Broadcom to acquire VMware. VMware is the one of the biggest players on the virtualization market, but they're not doing only like virtualization, they're doing much more than that, of course. Containers, services around that, uh, data recovery, name it, sure. But this, this is pretty much a big thing. Uh, well, for Marantis as well, of course. So how that actually affects um, our business, how the, the things that we do. As I mentioned previously, uh, one of the flagship technologies at Marantis is Marantis OpenStack for Kubernetes. What is OpenStack? Well, for those that we do, who don't know that, who hear this for the first time, so it's a big, very big open source project. It's a framework that allows you to build your own private cloud on your premise, in your data center and use it just like the way you use Amazon Web Services, but completely under your control, under your uh, supervision. And well, the data doesn't go anywhere, right? So it's completely kind of a secure in that regards. It's a huge framework, which contains a numerous amount of services. The community is really, the open source community is really big. 
it's a second uh, in terms of its size uh, after Linux community. Well, yeah, you can imagine that. The project is um, itself started, well, more than 10 years ago, I believe, right? It, it has walked a long path from the early you know, adoption to maturity. And now you can probably um, hear about it being used by really, really big companies and in investing into their own private infrastructure based on, based on open source. And well, that's what OpenStack can do for you, right? This is what OpenStack provides in terms of the uh, services that you as a user can consume, can use through the tools, through the CLI, through the web graphical interface to deploy and manage your virtualized applications. Uh, but this is just like the core, right? This is the core services. Pretty, it might pretty much resemble what Amazon provides, but as you know, Amazon also does more than that. So, so does OpenStack, really. Well, well of course, there is a trick, right? Well, you might say, well, it's an open source platform which can do a lot. An open source means, is it free, right? Yes, it is. You can take the code, you can deploy it. So what's the catch, right? Well, uh, the catch is that OpenStack, because of its whole flexibility and power, is a complex beast to tame. It's complex. You need to have uh, a certain amount of knowledge and experience with all these technologies, uh, with the virtualization, with the code Python, because OpenStack is written in Python, to run your private OpenStack based private cloud really efficiently. So, deploying an OpenStack cloud, if we're talking about like upstream vanilla version, it turns into a really big adventure for uh, a lot of companies. So, there needs to be a way to make the cloud design deployment easy and simple, right? It's a big opportunity for uh, vendors such as Marantis <laughs> to increase the resiliency of the resulting deployment of the resulting cloud. And of course, um, you kind of uh, do some hardening improvements around the place to make it more stable, more predictable, and of course, extend the uh, vanilla OpenStack with the additional tools that provide to that allow to uh, may uh, have the operations like such as updates, upgrades done really in an easy fashion, right? And also, of course, to provide tools to uh, have for operators to have transparency into what's going on underneath to do like monitoring, collect logs, analyze them. So it's a uh, Big thing, right? So the something that vanilla upstream OpenStack wouldn't really let you do. Well, at least without having uh, read like a thousand of books, some thousand pages of manuals. Okay, so what do we suggest? Marantis has a unique approach uh, of combining the flexibility of OpenStack with the power of Kubernetes and make it all, all once put together an ultimate cloud infrastructure platform. Yeah, sounds good, but what does it mean technically? What do we do for that? How does Kubernetes help us to tame the OpenStack beast? Uh, yeah, what are the benefits of OpenStack's Kubernetesization, as we say? So as I mentioned in the beginning of our, uh, our talk. So we apply the same practices as which are typical in the, you know, Kubernetes applications world, the, using the same kind of uh, mechanisms and uh, tools that Kubernetes provides to make the such a complex application as OpenStack itself is easily deployable, manageable, and configurable. So to be very specific, right? Um, Self-healing, right? Self-healing uh, is something that is achieved through automatic 
restart well detection of this component failure and its restart reconnection into the or plugging into the whole system. Okay, this is something that Kubernetes can do for you. You just need to tell it how, right? To explain, write a rule. Auto scaling, right? You have a OpenStack cloud which is uh, going through like uh, large peak de load, peak demand on the customer. Customers are creating VMs, doing VMs. So yeah, it all requires more additional services to process this demand. And again, we can write a rule in Kubernetes language um, that would tell, okay, once that such thing happens, you need to add more API components into the mix, into the control plane. And when the demand goes away, bring it down back to, again, save up resources. A very powerful mechanism that Kubernetes provides are rolling updates. So quickly substituting one thing, one component uh, of a specific one version with a new version so that no one notices. I'm putting this very, very simply, but it's a big deal really for specifically for OpenStack. And of course, such basic, basic things like uh, containerization and delivering components as with all their dependencies as a part of Docker images. This allows us to uh, update the host AS components and OpenStack components independently from each other. So it really altogether this really improves the reliability of the cloud infrastructure and specifically removes um, kind of a, the problem of downtimes for cloud users if you need to do like cloud maintenance, right? So they, they, they wouldn't even notice that because of these techniques being applied. And well, for operators who are in charge of the cloud infrastructure, this really helps to make their life easy, like to do uh, regular maintenance, regular operations in a simplified way without being afraid that, well, something being done wrong would kill the, like, you know, uh, would affect the um, cloud users or the workloads. Good. Right. So, but is it only just about OpenStack? Well, obviously, there is another trick here, right? you need Kubernetes. Where this Kubernetes will, would come from, a Kubernetes cluster, right? It needs to be somewhere. It needs to be deployed on top of bare metal. It needs to be, or VMs, or where does it come from? Uh, this is the slice of Marantis's portfolio of products, as you can see. So we have a, a Marantis Kubernetes engine distribution. It's a, it's, it's a distro of Kubernetes, essentially, and Docker combined with Docker Swarm, right? which provides an under, underlay for Marantis OpenStack for Kubernetes, right? So this is a good um, kind of a combination of the products. Of course, Kubernetes requires container runtime. Well, we also have a solution for that container runtime uh, Docker, basically. Uh, there needs to be a storage solution, right? To store all the uh, workloads data efficiently in a resilient uh, manner, we have a, a Ceph containerized, well, Kubernetes, so to say, um, Ceph distribution to achieve this as well. And this all lives on top of uh, various operating systems. Our primary operating system is Ubuntu. Of course, we can deploy uh, this on top of bare metal. We can deploy it, well, the Kubernetes we can deploy on top of public cloud, yes. Well, although in case of OpenStack, it doesn't really make sense. It wouldn't really make sense. That's why we, for OpenStack, we're using bare metal flavor of uh, Kubernetes engine and then put OpenStack on top of that. Uh, on the right, there is a solution uh, which provides full stack login monitoring and alerting for all of these components, right? And on the left is our Swiss Army knife, like ultimate. Uh, lifecycle manager, so to say. So this is um, so Marantis Container Cloud. It basically serves the purpose of uh, provisioning all of these layers, right? Configuring them and making sure they keep like being aligned. 
with each other. So it's a universal interface for operators to control all of these, kind of all layers of this pie. Then, right, okay, what do the end users get? They get the ability to run their VMs on top of OpenStack. And of course, if they need Kubernetes clusters, right, uh, for their own purpose, for their own apps, they can always deploy this, uh, the same right, as Kubernetes engine on top inside VMs and run uh, applications in the mixed mode, like partially in VMs, partially in containers, or purely in containers inside VMs. No problem with that. Good, but that's not all. That's not all. Like, I mean, you can of course take a vanilla uh, upstream version of OpenStack, but would that be sufficient to provide like a really reliable uh, virtualized platform, right? To build to build one? No, it it will not. So. What is actually there inside Narantis OpenStack for Kubernetes in, in addition to what's just described? So first, we of course rely on upstream on open on open source version of OpenStack. Primarily we take code from the upstream, but we do hardening and security validation of every particular uh, component and we do the packaging. So 99% it's open source, but also there are certain security patches that we at Marantz supply to the upstream code to make it really hardened. Of course, uh, we use the power of Kubernetes to write down the you know rules how uh, OpenStack control plane should behave to ensure that uh, OpenStack cluster can be easily updated without impact. You know, on the workloads, on the users, and well, can react to failures properly. So it's a life cycle management logic that we put into in addition around the upstream uh, source code base. Uh, as I mentioned previously, Marantis Container Cloud provides us with a full stack life cycle management, provision of bare metal machines, deployment of host operating system, deployment of Kubernetes on top of that, and then, of course, OpenStack components even even further, right? So it's a layer by layer, and well, um, gives us tools and uh, handles to manage this whole all of these layers in day two. Smart stack lights, yeah, um, is extended. Well, is configured to do specifically monitoring, alerting, and logging for OpenStack, so based on the specific criteria that are specifically applicable and make sense in the context of OpenStack to make sure that your OpenStack cluster lives long and healthy life. Okay, so this is in, to summarize kind of the value of it. If we look uh, at the bigger picture, Right. So, what does Marantis do altogether with all of these products? There are much more than that, actually. Not only Kubernetes and OpenStack, we're also doing application management, uh, so things like secure registry for uh, Docker images. So, it's a suite of products that allows us to cover a pretty wide market. Uh, so, we we help our customers implement, uh, deliver their virtualized applications. We help our customers to deliver their containerized applications anywhere, like bare metal, private cloud, public cloud. It's not really a problem. So for any kind of, kind of combination of platforms and um, environments you can think of, there will be a solution based on that, based on our technology stack. So how does that help? How does it practically help um, our customers to their business? And the answer is acceleration, right? So let's take this evolution path that we described previously as a granted thing. Yes, so let's assume that everybody's eventually going to be somewhere on the serverless side of things. The question is, how soon will you start doing things really efficiently. 
and how much investment would that actually require and how to, to achieve that, right? how to get there. So, and Rajas provides answers to all of these questions, right? So first and foremost, we offer uh, technology products that would allow you to build your own hybrid cloud infrastructure and manage it with very little investment. So basically, we, we call this the zero ops concept, right? Zero ops meaning that you don't have to spend your time doing all the dirty work, like deployment of servers, mm, provisioning of servers, management, reaction to the hardware fillers, everything, everything will take care of this, of this for you. You only would have to do your like, business, right? So you don't have to care about the infrastructure. If you want to go further, we can all also offer the application delivery tools, the platform that allows you to speed up the delivery of your um, apps. Well, give you an example like CI CD systems, right? We can build these systems for you. We can maintain these systems for you. All you need to do is just to focus on the, your on your code, right? Not to worry about anything. This is also a zero ops way of doing things. So, but again, this is optional. You can choose what pieces of uh, dirty work you would like to delegate to Rantis and what you would prefer still to do yourself. It's really kind of a flexible framework uh, that allows to build a unique uh, value proposition that you need for your particular case. So through this zero ops um, hybrid cloud infrastructure and application delivery platforms, we would we will accelerate your business delivery and make it make it this evolution happen for you much sooner than doing things yourself or like than other vendors. So at this point, um, I would like to conclude uh, the, my presentation. And good. Uh, in that case, I would like to thank the audience for attendance and wish you all good day and safe cloud journey.